I'm sure that all of you have heard about the law of unintended consequences where sometimes things work out in ways that were unexpected, uh, unforeseen, totally different than, than what you figured would happen. There's an oft-repeated example of, of this law. It's said to have occurred in colonial India. Uh, supposedly, during the British colonization, Delhi suffered a proliferation of cobras. And that's a problem. Cobras are lit on the dangerous side, so having these cobras uh, slithering around the city was a problem. In order to cut the number of cobras that were in the city, the local government placed a bounty on the cobras. That, that seemed like a good solution. The bounty was, was generous enough that it motivated people to get rid of the cobras. So people took up cobra hunting. And that led to exactly the desired outcome. The, the cobra population decreased. And that's when things got interesting. The cobra population fell, but as it became harder and harder to find cobras out in the wild, the, the people became rather entrepreneurial. They started raising cobras in their home. They'd raise the cobras, and then they'd kill the cobras, and they'd turn them in for the bounty. That led to a new problem. The, the local authorities realized that we hardly ever see a cobra in the wild any longer in the city, but we're still paying the same amount of bounty out. So the city did the reasonable thing. They canceled the bounty. In response, the people did the reasonable thing. Who wants a live cobra in your home? So they released the cobras from their home. In the end, Delhi had a bigger cobra problem than they had before they'd ever started the program. The unintended consequences there. This evening, we're going to see unintended consequences. As we turn back to our study through Genesis, Jacob is going to experience some unintended consequences of the actions he's undertaken to this point. And as Jacob has these consequences, we should learn an important lesson about our God. Last week, uh, you may recall, we, we had the, the high point in our series examining the, the Isaac section of Genesis. Last week, Jacob... Uh, Isaac's younger twin son, if you want to call him that, and look him that way. I, I'm Jacob, the son that God chose to pass his covenant to. We, we saw Jacob become a true worshiper of God. That really is the high point, when, when a, a person who is a non-worshiper of God becomes a worshiper of God. Jacob had been a schemer, he had been a liar, he had been a blasphemer, he had been deceitful, and... All of that led to problems, all within Isaac's dysfunctional family, remember? And those schemes of Jacob had raised the wrath of his brother Esau. To the point that Jacob was fleeing for his life, but as he fled, just before he left the land of promise, he had an encounter with God. Jacob encountered God. God divinely visited Jacob in a dream, and, and Jacob changed forever. God had chosen to bless Jacob with the promised covenant, that, that those blessings in the covenant, those were promised to Jacob by God. God had made that decision before Jacob was ever born, but now God reinforced them personally with Jacob. So like his grandfather Abraham, his father Isaac, Jacob's encounter with God transformed him into a genuine worshiper. Jacob trusted God and, and expected that God would indeed do all that he had promised that Jacob would have many descendants, that he would have a future possession of the land, that he'd have a role in blessing all the peoples of the earth. Jacob believed that all of this would come about. Of course, we do recall that he woke up in the morning with his new faith, still fleeing the land, because his brother was still seeking to kill him. Tonight, we're going to pick up right where we left off. As Jacob arrives at his destination, we no longer trace his, his leaving of the land. He, he was hoping to head out of the land, and he was heading towards his, brother, his mother's brother, Laban, 
who was living in an area to the northeast of, of the Promised Land up in Paddan Aram. He was hoping to find refuge there as well as his desire was to find a wife. Well, tonight we'll pick up with him arriving right at that destination, and, and we'll rapidly cover seven years of, of time tonight. Seven years will pass, but, but in that time, Moses is only going to record three events for us. Two events at the beginning of the seven years and one at the, the end of that time. We're in Genesis chapter 29 tonight. The, the first event that, that Moses gives us in this chapter, the first event records how Jacob meets Rachel. I'm sure we all know that Rachel becomes his wife. This is the thing, when you go through these narratives of Old Testament, we we know the basic stories. But let's look at them a little deeper as we see Jacob meets Rachel in the first 14 verses. Look at verse 1. Then Jacob went on his journey and came to the land of the sons of the east. He looked and saw a well in the field, and behold, three flocks of sheep were lying there beside it. For from that well they watered the flocks. Now the stone on the mouth of the well was large. When all the flocks were gathered there, they would then roll the stone from the mouth of the well and water the sheep, and put the stone back in its place on the mouth of the well. Jacob said to them, My brothers, where are you from? And they said, We are from Haran. He said to them, Do you know Laban, the son of Nahor? They said, We know him. And he said to them, Is it well with him? And they said, It is well, and here is Rachel, his daughter, coming with the sheep. He said, Behold, it is still high day. It is not time for the livestock to be gathered. Water the sheep and go pasture them. But they said, We cannot until all the flocks are gathered. And they roll the stone from the mouth of the well. Then we water the sheep. While he was still speaking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherdess. When Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, Jacob went up and rolled the stone from the mouth of the well and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. Do you think Laban's his mother's brother? Then Jacob kissed Rachel and, and lifted his voice and wept. Jacob told Rachel that he was a relative of her father and that he was Rebekah's son, and she ran and told her father. So when Laban heard the news of Jacob, his sister's son, he ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him and brought him to his house. Then he related to Laban all these things. Laban said to him, Surely you are my bone and my flesh. So he stayed with him a month. Now, if these verses that we just read feel a little bit like deja vu, then then you have a pretty good memory. A, A year and a half ago, in our time, we were working through the life of Abraham. And as we worked through the life of Abraham, we came to Genesis chapter 24, where Abraham sends his servant to seek a wife for Isaac. Abraham's servant came along the same journey now that Jacob has just completed. Abraham's servant stopped at a well, and Abraham's servant met Rebekah, who turned out to be Abraham's, grand, Abraham's grandniece, the, the granddaughter of Abraham's brother. And, of course, Rebekah became Isaac's wife, who then became Jacob's mother. Now we have Jacob stopping at well. We have Jacob meeting Rachel, who turns out to be Rebekah's niece. The, the parallels here between the introduction to Rebekah in chapter 24 and the introduction to Rachel in, in this chapter 29, they're, they're numerous. Moses specifically lays out all kinds of parallels for us. We should have a deja vu feeling especially if you're just reading through this account. Uh, I know math is a little rusty, but how many chapters is it between 24 and 29? Okay, How long will it take you to read that number of chapters? Not very long, right? Five to ten minutes? So it should be ringing in your head if you're reading through this. It's like, we've heard all this before. In fact, let me go a step further before we actually dig into the text that just read... I don't think it's any stretch to say that the parallels are intentional. Moses has carefully crafted things so that we would note the, the, the repeat occurrence. In chapter 24, the, the main lesson that, that came out of that chapter is that God specifically guided Abraham's servant to Rebekah. The example of God's leading a servant was a lesson for all of us. We were to understand that, that all of God's people have the same God guiding them faithfully. In what we just read, there's no explicit reference to the Lord's leading Jacob. 
Moses made that explicit in chapter 4, but because of these parallels, we should see that the same thing's happening again. God is leading Jacob. God is doing for Jacob the exact same thing he did for Abraham's servant. Jacob meeting Rachel here is just as much a result of God's divine hand of guidance as with the servant's meeting of, Rachel, or of Rebecca a generation earlier. God's guiding Jacob, one of his people. So now let's look more closely at how God guided Jacob. Moses begins the chapter here with an interesting phrase. What we have translated in New American Standard as simply Jacob went on his journey is literally Jacob picked up his feet and went to the land of the sons of the east. Moses making point that, that, that Jacob responded to the promises they received at Bethel. God had told him, I will be with you, I will bring you back. And hearing that, Jacob immediately in the morning picks up his feet and goes. God will be with Jacob wherever he went. So Jacob immediately continues on his journey to find Rebekah's family. Then we notice the details of the trip are just skipped over. He, he picks up his feet to go and he arrives. If all of our trips could be that easy, right? We just skip over all the stuff in between. The, the details skipped over, but the next thing we're told is that he arrived in a field that contains a well. Apparently it's the middle of the afternoon, sometime before evening, but there are already three flocks gathered there with their shepherds. They're, they're gathered around the well. And the point is made here in the text that this well, not only is these three flocks gathered around, there's a large stone stopping the mouth of the well. And we're told that stone was only removed to water the sheep after all the flocks in the area have gathered. Now there's quite a bit of speculation in over the centuries, if you read commentaries or anything. Over the centuries, people have speculated regarding both the shepherds and the, the stone. Um, the shepherds that were waiting at the well and the stone. Some commentators suggest that the shepherds being there early in the day before time suggest these are three lazy shepherds. Um, they're, they're, they're coming in early. And it's possible. Um, Especially considering the fact that, that Jacob does instruct them that, you know, you should water your sheep and go back and, and pasture them longer. Others suggest that the stone may have been so large that only a, a greater number than three men could roll it aside. That's why they're waiting. They need more people to come so that they can actually move the stone. Well, if that's the case, then Jacob is nearly superhuman when he rolls it aside by himself. And, Personally, I'm not sure we should draw any great conclusion from, from these details. It, it would seem that God has just providentially placed these shepherds at the well so that they're there to provide information to Jacob. They, they serve as a contrast for Jacob's self-confident initiative when he rolls the stone away because he sees a need. They're there as a foil for him, a contrast. And they give him the information that this lady approaching, she's tied into the one you're looking for. This is Rachel. So he learns that from these shepherds. They're gathered at the well, and, and he learns from them, first of all, that he's very near the end of his journey. He's near Haran. That's, that's the town in Paddan Aram is the, the region. The town is Haran. That's where Rachel's brother, Laban, lived. Or Rebecca's brother, rather, Laban. Too many family people here. If I get confused, bear with me. Rebecca's brother, Laban. So he learns he's near that, that town. And learning he's there, he immediately asks, how is Laban? And he learns, well, Laban's fine. He's living in the nearby town. And, and then, here we see God, again, providentially making things come out from a timing standpoint. This providential timing of the Lord comes in play, just like in chapter 24 when Abraham's servant arrived there. As soon as Jacob asks about Laban, he, he, the men are still speaking. They're, they're, and notice, they're not saying a whole lot. They're just saying he, he's fine in, in the city. But while they're still speaking, there's Rachel, Laban's daughter, coming over the, the hill, approaching with another group of sheep. Jacob, he's not concerned about the local customs. The, and, and much like Moses later on will we'll help the daughters of, of Ruel, the Midianite priest in in the wilderness, water the sheep in Exodus 2. Jacob does the same thing. Forget the local customs, water the sheep. He, he rolls the rock from the, the mouth of the well. He waters her sheep. And, and in recording this, Moses 
In case you didn't catch it there in verse 10, Moses is emphasizing there's a family connection between Jacob and Rachel. Look at verse 10. What's the connection? She's the daughter of his mother's brother. She is Laban, his mother's brother. She is Laban, his mother's brother. There's a family connection here. Don't miss it. You know, whenever something's repeated in Scripture, especially in the Old Testament, we're to pay attention to it because words are used with premium. And when you have three times in one verse this detail, Moses wants to make sure God brought the relative there. We're we're to see that. This is the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. Even though there's no mention, and like I said, of God's hand in any of this, we don't see any record of, of God explicitly stated. It doesn't say the Lord did this. Even though that's missing explicitly, the emotional response of verse 11 shows us that, that Jacob sees the providential hand of God arranging things. He, he cries out, he kisses Rachel and lifts his voice and, and weeps. God has arranged the details of the meeting that has just occurred. God has brought Jacob to the right place at the right time to find out that the right girl is just arriving. He, he tells Rachel who he is. He's Rebecca's son. She immediately runs and tells her father. That, that suggests that, that their home is nearby. Laban immediately runs out to, to meet Jacob, his, his nephew, and, and he gives him a warm welcome. I'm sure that when Moses says Jacob, there in verse um, 13, when Moses says Jacob related to Laban all these things, that, that would include telling Laban about the, the timing of all this, how God brought him right to the right place at the right time to, to meet Rachel. Laban's pronouncement there in in verse 14, look at that. He says, surely you are my bone and my flesh. Does that ring any bells? That echoes the the joyous words of Adam in Genesis 2.23, when when Adam first lays eyes on Eve and and he says, this is now of my flesh and my bones, or my bone and my flesh. Laban is acknowledging here that Jacob and him have a very close tie. They're they're family. God's moving in Jacob's life. The the parallels here between this record and and Genesis 24 make that clear. But the parallels also cast a shadow on Jacob's character. If we think about the parallel, in chapter 24, when Abraham's servant was directed to Rebekah, the servant responds immediately by worshiping God. And, and then he, when he meets Laban, he acknowledges very quickly and openly before Laban that, that God's hand, the Abraham's Lord, is moved in all these events that have transpired. God brought me here. We fail to see anything of that sort with Jacob. As I said, the, the name of the Lord is sadly absent from our text. We see all these things here as Jacob meets Rachel. Now let's read how Jacob works for Rachel. Picking up in verse 15, Jacob works for Rachel. This would be a month later. Remember, we're at the second event. I said there's three events. A month later here, then Laban says to Jacob, Because you are my relative, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what shall your wages be? Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. And Leah's eyes were weak, but Rachel was beautiful of form and face. Now Jacob loved Rachel, so he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, It is better that I give her to you than to give her to another man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of his love for her. Apparently, for that first month, Jacob was not just sitting around as he stayed with Laban. Uh, it, the impression you get is that he was working. He was helping out with the sheep or doing whatever jobs needed to be done around there. And after a month, Laban then turns to Jacob and says, What kind of compensation should I, I give you for this work you're doing? Now, we've established fact Jacob is family. He, he's not a slave. He's not a hired hand. From Laban's perspective, that puts him in a unique category. He's family. What would be an appropriate wage for family? 
Well, that question presents an opportunity for Jacob. We know Jacob is good when it comes to opportunities. We know, if you remember, how he acquired his birthright from Esau. There was an opportunity. He could give Esau a bowl of stew in exchange for the birthright. Jacob knows how to use an opportunity when it presents itself. In this case, Jacob sees an opportunity to acquire the wife he desires. Now, I'm thinking this is a little sanctified imagination, maybe. Maybe less sanctified, I don't know. But I'm thinking that over the first month, Jacob might have spent some time helping Rachel care for the flocks. Because now we learn that Jacob has eyes for her. He loves her. He's fallen in love in that month. Rachel is described there in verse 17 as beautiful of form and face. In other words, she's stunning. That, that's the, the, the paraphrase, if you want, of that. She's stunning. And in fact, the second word that's used to describe her in verse 17 is the one, the, the one that we have translated there as her, she has a beautiful face. That's the same term that was used to describe Rebecca in Genesis 24 when Abraham's servant first saw her. She was beautiful. Well, her niece is beautiful as well. For the first time, we also learn in these verses that Rachel is not the only daughter that Laban has. There is an older daughter, Leah. And in contrast to Rachel's beauty, all we're told about Leah is that she has weak eyes. Now, I do know that some of our English versions translate it that she had tender eyes. And that is a valid translation of the Hebrew word, tender or weak, either one. But I think weak is better. Tender eyes may convey an attractive quality. But the way the eyes here are contrasted with Rachel's beauty, it doesn't seem like Moses is, is trying to give us an attractive quality. He, he's saying this is what makes her unattractive. Most likely, Leah's eyes are so weak that she is unable to assist in caring for the flock. And, and in that day, that would make her unattractive. She can't add to the, the, the wealth of the family. She can't see good enough to do the job. Well, what we do know is Jacob wants to marry Rachel. But remember, Jacob has nothing. He had to flee for his life. This wasn't like when Abraham sent his servant to this area the first time and sent his servant with a whole bunch of riches so that he could give gifts to be Rebekah's family at the time. He didn't know Nahor was dead and it'd be Laban, but... Abraham sent all kinds of gifts for a dowry to give, and Laban received this great dowry from, from Abraham. Jacob has nothing to offer as a dowry. He, he has nothing to offer for Rachel's hand until Laban asks him about wages. Here is an opportunity. The opportunity that Jacob needs. He has his labor he can offer as a dowry. So he offers to work for seven years in exchange for Rachel's dowry. And Laban agrees. And we're told the years fly by. They, they seem but a few days because of his love. He loves her. So we have Jacob meets Rachel. Jacob works for Rachel. Which brings us to Jacob marries. And the way I word it is, ouch. Deception. The next thing we would expect is Jacob marries Rachel. Isn't that the way an ideal story works? Boy meets girl. Boy goes through the hardship to earn the girl's hand. Boy marries the girl. Live happily ever after. Well, that's not the way it works here. We expect that, but things suddenly take a, a detour. That we expect things to head along the path for this wedding, but that's not what we encounter. Instead, we encounter deception. Things do not go as anticipated for Jacob and Rachel. Let's look at the third event as we jump to the end of seven years. Verse 21. Then Jacob says to Laban, Give me my wife, for my time is completed, that I may go into her. Laban gathered all the men of the place and made a feast. Now in the evening he took his daughter Leah and brought her to him, and Jacob went in to her. Laban also gave his maid Zilpha to his daughter Leah as a maid. So it came about in the morning that, behold, it was Leah. And he said to Laban, What is this you have done to me? Was it not for Rachel that I served with you? Why then have you deceived me? But Laban said, 
It is not the practice in our place to marry off the younger before the firstborn. Complete the week with this one, and we will give you the other also for the service which you will serve with me for another seven years. Jacob did so and completed her week, and he gave him his daughter Rachel as his wife. Laban also gave his maid Billa to his daughter Rachel as her maid. So Jacob went into Rachel also, and indeed he loved Rachel more than Leah, and he served with Laban for another seven years. The seven years are up here as we start this section. And Jacob doesn't want to wait longer for Rachel to become his wife. He approaches Laban and, and he asks Laban to finish the deal. I've given you the dowry. Give me my wife. So Laban agrees. He, he hosts the wedding. Laban schedules the wedding. The guests arrive. The feast is prepared and the festivities get underway. It's a traditional wedding. All seems to be going exactly as we would expect it to until we come to the unexpected in verse 23. It comes time for Jacob to consummate his marriage as part of the wedding. The festivities will go for a week, but on the wedding night, as we talked about on the Song of Solomon, it was traditional that the, the bride and groom would consummate their, their wedding. Laban pulls a swap. Instead of sending Rachel into the tent where Jacob is waiting, he sends in Leah. Jacob, completely unaware of the deception, consummates a marriage with Leah rather than Rachel. That's deception of the highest order. Oftentimes the question has come up in our mind, how could this be possible? How could Jacob not know it was the wrong woman in the tent with him? Well, we can assume for one thing it was completely dark in the tent. There weren't any candles or lanterns. It's completely dark there. We don't know for sure, but... It is quite possible that wine has played a role in the, the feast as well, deadening his senses somewhat. It's also possible from what we know of the customs of the day that Leah wore a veil, that, that in many of the surrounding cultures was a historical custom that the, the bride would wear a veil until after the consummation of the, the wedding. All we know is that Jacob, we're told, has no idea he's sleeping with Leah rather than Rachel. It's only when the morning light comes and, and Jacob can see clearly they discuss the, the wrong sister. This is the wrong person. Jacob has been deceived. But let's think about who was not deceived in our story. Jacob is deceived, but who was not deceived? Laban clearly knew which daughter he had passed into the tent. No deception there. Uh, on Laban's part, he, he was the deceiver, and his deception of Jacob was intentional. He passed the wrong sister in. When confronted with the deception in the morning by, by Jacob, he just uses the excuse, well, it's our custom. We marry the older one before we marry the, the younger. We marry the eldest first. Let's not forget, Laban had seven years to discuss this complication if, if he was really that concerned about it. There, there's been seven years that that Laban's observed Jacob's love for Rachel. He, he's watched Jacob work diligently in anticipation of this night. Swapping the daughters like this is an act of shameless treachery. There's no other way to cast it. Also, so we know, one, Laban's not deceived. Also, number two, we know there's Leah was not deceived. Leah definitely, there's no doubt that she, that she was deceived herself. She was in on the deception. After all, she was the one walking into the tent, giving herself to Jacob, and not making any sound that would give herself away. So Leah is directly involved in the deception of the man who is now her husband. She's married to a man who does not love her, a man who thought she was her sister. We, we might feel a bit sorry for Leah's situation, but, but let's not lose sight of, of the fact that she plays a blatant role in the treachery that, that occurs here in these verses. Furthermore, where is Rachel throughout this entire night? There, there's a feast going on. It's her wedding feast. This supposedly is the night of her marriage. Where is she? she? She cannot be wandering around the feast when she's supposedly in a tent with Jacob. So it's not like she just went out and, and continued eating. What is she doing the entire night that we never hear her voice raised in protest? We can only assume that she's aware of her father's plan and, and that through her silence is accepting it. 
it would seem Rachel is aware that the man who loves her is being deceived. In fact, not only is she apparently aware, through her silence, she aids in the deception. We see from the conclusion here that that Laban is not opposed to, to Rachel marrying Jacob. Rather, using these local customs of marrying the eldest first, Laban sees an opportunity to marry off a daughter who would have a very hard time attracting a husband. In the economics of the day, Leah was not an attractive wife. Laban willingly gives Rachel to Jacob after the week of marriage celebration is complete for Leah. He doesn't have a problem that Jacob's marrying Rachel. He wants to find a husband or, or create a husband for Leah. And he does that through treachery, through deception. That's what has happened. But if we look more carefully at how Moses records what happened, we can see Moses is doing more than simply informing the nation that, that rose out of Jacob's children about this event in their family history. Yes, Moses does tell us this is also where the, the maids Zilpha and Billa come into play. This is how we get all four women involved in the, the family history. But he's doing more than just that. Remember, these events are happening within the flow of the covenant promises coming from, going, or being passed from one generation to another. We've just seen Jacob receive the covenant blessings directly from God. In the promise flow of, of the covenant blessings, in that flow of things, this wedding night is a significant phase because this is night now where we have uh, uh, the next generation forming husband and wife that will lead to the many descendants. Remember, God said, you will have many descendants. We'd expect this to be a pivotal, a pivotal night. It begins another stage in fulfilling the blessings of promise that God's given. Jacob, the heir of promise, is gaining a wife who should become the mother of fulfillment. This ought to be a night of joy, a night of celebration. Instead, it becomes a night of treacherous deception. A night that's filled with pain. A night that might even appear as a disaster. Look more closely at verse 25. Jacob says, What is this that you have done to me? That question may ring some mental bells for you. It echoes the protest that Pharaoh gave Abraham in Genesis 12, 18. When was Abram at that time tried to pass Sarai off as his sister, right after he had received the promises from God, Abraham jeopardized the promises of God. And Pharaoh says, what is this you have done? Again, that cry goes up in Genesis 20, verse 9, when Abraham, now renamed, but Abraham attempts to pass Sarah off again as his sister to Abimelech among the Philistines. What is this you have done? We heard the cry a generation later in Genesis 26.10 when Isaac attempted to pull the same trick before Abimelech and the Philistines with Rachel, passing her off as a sister. And Abimelech says, what is this you have done? In every case, the, the deceptive actions of men had put the promises of God into jeopardy. Of course, if you recall, when we went through those chapters, in every case when you heard that question posed, we were reminded that the original time that question was posed was Genesis 3.13, when God in the garden turns to Eve and says, what is this you have done? Moses carefully uses the same wording time and again. The fundamental reason that God has given the promises to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, is because mankind has acted treacherously against God. Beginning in the garden, mankind rebelled against God. God had to step in with his promises to graciously right the wrongs because there was no other option. God will provide a way for mankind to be forgiven. God will make sure that mankind receives his blessing. Still, time and again, mankind works against God's gracious acts. Does everything in in mankind's Ability to undermine what God has promised and, and place his promises in jeopardy, requiring God to intervene. And all of those connections should rattle around in our heads as, as we read this question in verse 25 What is this you have done? Another question should come to mind as we read the, the last question in that same verse What is this you have done for me? And then, why then have you deceived me? 
That, that word deceived has only been used by Moses one other time so far in this book. And that's in Genesis 27, verse 35. When Isaac said to Esau, your brother came deceitfully and have taken away your blessing. The only other time Moses used this word is when Jacob was the deceiver, not the deceived. There's no doubt that Jacob had been deceived. Now, Jacob can know what it feels like to be on the receiving end. Up to this point, Jacob's been given the opportunity um, uh, been by, by blatantly deceiving his, his father in a manner that there's no less repugnant than what he's experienced on Laban, but Jacob doesn't seem to have any conscience about what he's done. There, there doesn't seem to be any regret. He's been on the, the giving end, not the receiving end. Now he knows what it's like to be deceived. One other point to notice uh, here, Moses has Laban using the term firstborn in verse 26, rather than elder when he refers to Leah. It is not our practice, or not the practice in our place to marry off the younger before the firstborn. We, we'd been told that there was an elder sister, the older was Leah in verse 16, but now she's specifically called firstborn. This too is significant. The reason Jacob had to flee for his life is because he deceived his father in order to get his father to set aside the social conventions that were related to the firstborn and to grab the, the promised blessing from his father. Conviction, or, or convention rather, dictated that the blessing should go to the firstborn. Jacob deceived to receive it himself. It's just another literary pin that, that Moses sticks into the text here to, to help us notice that Jacob is experiencing the law of unintended consequences as God ensures that he reaps what he's sown, deception. Jacob is now married. He went to become married, and he's now married, in fact, doubly so. He's married Rachel as he wished, but he's also married to Leah. And ultimately, his marriage began with pain and deception. Well, that completes the review of the passages we're going to look at this evening. We're going to stop there in, in chapter 29. But what, what lesson can we learn as we put these three events together? Jacob meets Rachel. Jacob works for Rachel. But the marriage doesn't quite come out as expected. What can we learn from that? God, clearly, we see in the first part, is guiding Jacob to this place. As a new worshiper of God, he did not arrive there by accident. Yet we also remember Jacob did not arrive there through righteous actions. Deception has been Jacob's tool of choice, trying to grab God's blessing through his own efforts, through his own manipulations, rather than trusting God. Now God is ensuring not only that the blessings still move forward, God has promised the blessings will go forward, God's ensuring that, but they're moving forward in a way that allows Jacob to experience consequences for his actions. God allowed for the blessings to go forward in a way that allows Jacob to feel what he himself has dealt out to others. Moses has recorded this as a warning, as an admonition for all of us who read it to, to learn from Jacob's life so that we will avoid his errors. That the way I would express the overall lesson that we can take from this passage as we put it all together is, is this. God always disapproves of unrighteous actions, even when the results appear to align with his purposes. God always disapproves of unrighteous actions, even if we look at the results and say, yeah, no, that's accomplishing what God has said it would accomplish. Let's not be fooled. God always disapproves of unrighteous actions, even when the results appear to align with his purposes. Because, because God's promises were moving forward through Jacob, Jacob could try to forget as he was traveling out of the land, he could try to forget that he had done a lot of unrighteous activities in, throughout his past here. His life was strewn with this unrighteousness. But he could just kind of ignore that mentally in his mind. God allows him here to taste what it feels like to be on the receiving end. To remind Jacob that these things are not approved by God. 
God did not need Jacob to resort to unrighteous actions in order to obtain what God had promised to give. Neither do we. Let's not fool ourselves. We do unrighteous things trying to achieve God's promises ourselves at times. Trying to find the good that God has promised through unrighteousness. And and if we don't feel the consequences right away, then we begin pushing that in the back of our mind or convincing ourselves it really wasn't that bad. We, yeah, we told a little white lie, but it was for good. God always disapproves of unrighteous actions. Always. It doesn't matter if they appear to advance God's purposes or, God, or not. God never needs us to resort to unrighteousness to accomplish his purposes. And let's also learn from this that God can ensure that our actions can reap unintended consequences. When we act unrighteously, we can be reaping problems for ourselves. Just because we don't see all the cobras that are growing in the houses doesn't mean that the results of our unrighteous actions won't mean there's more cobras running around our lives afterwards. God can arrange to have all those cobras released, just like happened in Delhi. God always disapproves of unrighteous actions, even when the results appear to align with his purposes. Let's pray. Father, again, we come to you grateful for the record of Jacob's life. Father, as we see here in Jacob's life, as well as in the lives of his father and grandfather, we see that these are not perfect men, but they do have a perfect God who's working in their lives. Father, we see some of what you do as the perfect God working in their lives is bring consequences about because of their unrighteousness. So that Jacob will learn, and Father, sometimes you do the same for us. You bring consequences into our lives so that we will learn that what you desire from us is faith and trust and obedience. You don't need our manipulative hand to intervene. That we simply are to trust you and to serve you. And you will accomplish your purpose. Father, I pray that you would help us learn that lesson tonight. In Christ's name, amen. Thank mm-hmm. you.